to an arts committee and fashion committee um, meeting. Tonight we're going to have uh, Travis Ganim from Urban Hardwoods uh, talk about his uh, company and the furniture that they make from salvaged trees. Um, it's artful because it's definitely gorgeous furniture and gorgeous hardwood. So let's get started and I'll have Travis start up. Thank you, Greg. And, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, to learn more about urban hardwoods. Um, I am the sales manager here. I've been working here for about six years now. And uh, it's, a, it's a very fun job because it's a very unique material and you're always working with people who really appreciate it on a deeper level. Um, we are a furniture company, but we're kind of much more than that as well. Um, we, uh, if you ask anyone in the Seattle area, most people know about us for salvaging trees and making beautiful furniture. And so I'll dive right into our process with, I guess, from start to finish. And I'll eventually on this tour, I'll be walking around and also show you some video clips as well, um, highlighting our process. Um, so to start off, usually the, the very beginning of our process is we get a call from either a residential, uh, a, a resident, um, a business owner, or even a tree cutting service. They somehow have found themselves with usually a very large tree that is either sick or dying or it needs to come down for safety reasons. That latter one is a pretty popular one here in the Seattle area um, because we have so much rain and sunshine, perfect weather for all sorts of trees. And um, what I just touched on too with all sorts of trees, that's another kind of uniquely Pacific Northwest quality for, for the business we're in. We get so many different varieties of wood. Um, so we're, we're known for, of course, like cedar and Douglas fir, but uh, you know trees like uh, English elm, American elm, walnut, um, oak, maple, madrone, the list goes on and on, and those all grow in Seattle. So it's a great place to, to be on the hunt for wood. <laughs> um, so in addition, when someone contacts us, other than just meeting the criteria of probably having a hardwood tree that's fairly sizable, we need to make sure it is in a spot that is accessible. And by that, I mean, um, we need to be able to remove large portions of the tree, basically, enough that it could make, you know, up to, well, starting maybe at eight foot long and going up to, we make 14 foot long tables too. So we need sizable tree trunks. Um, and with that in mind, we do have a video queued up. If, Mike, if you wouldn't mind playing um, the tree cutting video at about seven minutes and 50 seconds. You got it, sir. Give me one second here. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this video will show one of our largest tree salvages. <coughs> so this is can everyone hear me right now yep I, still so hear you. An, I believe this is an english elm tree and i believe it was one of the largest english elm trees to ever be removed um from the seattle area it's a huge tree And so one thing to note is we actually don't do the tree removal, removal ourselves. We're generally contracting um, tree cutting services. Hey, Travis, Travis, forgive me. We can't, I don't think we can hear you over the sound of this. Would you like me to mute the volume on the, uh, on the. That's okay, actually. I can talk afterwards. Thank you. Okay, you let's, let's, let's resume. Thank you.
it sounds like from the messages you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you fine, Travis. I can't hear the video though. The and that's probably fine too. The video has a lot of chainsaw noise. Um, so so either we're one unable works. we're unable to hear the video. Yeah, well, you might be able to, but that, no no video sound coming through at all. We can hear with Travis just fine. Yeah. Gosh. Travis, where was this tree located? <laughs> ah, I believe that is an excellent question. I want to say Magnolia, but I'm not sure about that. It just comes to mind because I know we salvaged a large English elm from there. Um, I'm trying to look in the background too, actually, to see if I can kind of spot where the city is at or what city be is behind there. Um, I can get back with you on an answer on that. I do know it's within the city of Seattle. So massive tree here. This is not a typical salvage, I could say. This is, uh, again, one of our largest. But I will say we are looking for larger trees um, to the point where, um, you know, they, they are not easy to remove. Um, and, and virtually probably no other the tree cutting service would like to remove trees this way. It's uh, usually they're, they're chopped down in smaller sections, um, but that just can't happen for our use. The reason that we're oftentimes salvaging a little bit smaller trees than that is because those that big of a tree, uh, or I should say smaller trees, make up multiple boards in one table. And I'll be showing you uh, visually what that looks like later on, but essentially we don't need to use uh, or we don't use just one section of the tree to make the table. Um, you can kind of see some pieces behind me. Or oh, you're watching the video, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is it done? Not quite yet. Okay. I'll wait to show you that. I'm turning down the volume because apparently I can only hear it on my end. Ah. You, it's paused now, uh, Mike, for some reason. And I think we're just about to the end of the video regardless, so that might be a good stopping point. Okay. Well, after, after those logs are cut down, they go to our log yard in South Seattle where we let them rest. Um, we need to let them rest because obviously there's a lot of moisture in there in the elements, they're going to expand and contract. And just like a, a tree that's down in the forest, the, the end will probably split or splinter or crack. And we actually want that to happen before we start milling it. Um, but once those three months have passed, we are ready to mill up some slabs, um, which uh, is a kind of exciting part of the process. The, from our perspective, and especially from our Sawyer's perspective that runs the mill, um, it's the equivalent of opening up a geo because you'll be slicing into something you don't know exactly what's there, but there's going to be something beautiful under there. Um, exactly what is going to be found out. Um, and in addition to that, our Sawyer that's milling, he also is kind of like the first hand in the design process. He has to look at this very uniquely shaped log that's not perfectly straight and think about what kind of furniture um, we could make out of it. Is this, is this part of the tree going to make a bench? Is it going to make a large dining table? Um, if I cut it here and it makes a dining table, will the width be too wide or will it be too narrow or how are we going to piece it together? So he has to be the first one that starts to think about those kinds of questions. Um, in addition to that, one added kind of fun part of his job, maybe interesting part of his job, is that these are all urban salvage trees too. So uh, unlike trees that are farmed um, on a tree farm, um, these trees have been through a lot and have stories behind them, which means that you might hit a nail or you might hit um, bullets. We hit bullets semi-frequently in trees, believe it or not. Um, but also more odd things, like there might be a street sign embedded into a tree or part of a metal from a car that hit it 50 years ago. And so um, we have to, for, for most mills, those things would be disqualifications. They would not want to touch 
um, salvaged material. For us, it's incredibly worth it because each one of those things and, and the things that the tree went through create character in the final piece of furniture and create beautiful grain patterns that you'd really probably never see on typically on typical tree farm tree furniture. Um, so it's definitely worth it. And uh, but it, it gives him quite a jump from what I hear when he hits a nail with the saw blade. <laughs> um, all right, well, we, we mill all of these boards to three inches thick. Um, the intent behind that is that these boards over the next roughly three years that they'll be drying in our uh, drying facility, they're going to warp um, and they're gonna waffle and cup. That's all expected to happen. And obviously three inches in itself is too thick probably for most dining tables. And the reason we mill it that thick is because we'll need to sand it flat once we once it does do that warping. Um, and so we have excess material to basically get it flat again. The end product is about an inch and a half. And that usually shows, I mean, that shows you how much it could, I guess, change in that drying process. Um, I am going to try to show you um, some uh, of that wood before it's sanded. And I'll try to move the camera slowly so there's no motion sickness. And it's also going close to a blackout zone here in the shop where I won't have Wi-Fi, so I need to be careful. <laughs> but I'm going to try to show you these boards right here behind me. These are completely unsanded boards and unflattened boards. So I'm not sure if you can tell on the camera, but they are quite uh, uneven at this point. They don't really show their full beauty yet. And one thing I just realized I skipped over is before they actually get here, in between air drying and getting to our workshop, they are kiln dried as well. So air dried for three years and kiln dried for about almost a month after that. And so now they're to the point where they're at good moisture content to come to our workshop and start becoming furniture. Um, Going back to where I came from, I wanted to explain what was behind me a little bit further. So they need to be flattened. And once they're flattened, you can start seeing their full beauty in the grain. And I think if I carefully spin this around so it's not too fast, you can see all of our sanded slabs leaning up here against the wall. And these are pretty much on the last step before becoming a table. There's a little more sanding needed. There's a little more epoxy fill and joinery needed. But these are close enough to becoming a table where our customers can start visualizing it in their home. And using this uh, slab right here is a good example. This, is, I believe, is American Elm. And this is how a lot of our tables are configured. Um, it's not obvious once they're finished, but they're made of multiple boards here. This is a way of maximizing material. Trees just generally don't grow 41 inches wide, even here in Seattle. Um, and so this is a, a beautiful way of accomplishing a full table. All the boards are from the same tree you see here. But every once in a while, moving over here, we do have single slabs, we call them. This is no seams in it, just one huge walnut tree. Um, these are rarer than the, the multi-piece, as we call them. Um, I always tell our clients, I think they're both equally as beautiful. So I try not to let the multi-piece or single slab sway them too much. Um, I was just reading a comment there. I didn't quite get it. Someone, I think, went through our facility before on a tour, it sounded like. Um, so you can tell we try to get them in a wide, wide range of different sizes. Um, one of the reasons, of course, for that is because people want different sizes of dining tables. But in addition to dining tables, we also do commercial work. So we're making um, pretty sizable conference tables um, and team tables for folks. Um, I'm going to walk over here and try to show you one of our bars. team tables in progress. What, Art? Bars. 
Yes, bars. <laughs> I'll start by showing you this one here. So bear with me a moment. There we go. So this is a this is called a miter, also called like a, a waterfall edge. Essentially, this started off as being one flat board, and we kind of folded this side down. Um, so, and it's a little bit hard to see because this doesn't have finish yet to it, but it's a pretty smooth transition between surface and what makes the leg of the table. A pretty beautiful way of kind of making the grain continue on down to the floor. And this is, uh, I think, 72 inches long, but we do them a lot larger too. There's ones over here. This is one half and the other half is right here. And that's gonna go to one of our commercial customers um, that ordered both of these. Kind of a fun design, I think. Um, Mike, I think right now is a good time to show the second video that shows our team um, working on tabletops. Can we hear the sound, folks? I can't. No, sound. no not really. Volume's all the way up. This is probably one as well that doesn't need to be heard. It's beautiful music in the background. Um, and I'll I can try to narrate a little bit over what's happening here. So we use a lot of clamps because a lot of our work still involves gluing. Um, more clamping done there. Ah, so it looks like they're, most of our um, slabs are milled, I guess, vertically, how the, how the tree grows. Every once in a while we mill something horizontally to, get what we call flares. Um, and they're usually made uh, as coffee tables. So there's a fair amount of collaboration in our workshop, even though each one of our woodworkers has their own bench and largely their own projects. Um, they collaborate a lot with each other. Each one probably arguably has one special, well, maybe more than one special skill, but each have their own special skills. So, um, you know, one person's better at some things than others. And so it's, it is a collaborative process, even though everyone has their own individual work to work on, on a daily basis. What you see there is a bow tie joint. Um, not only a beautiful feature once finished, but something that's pretty much structurally required. Um, those bow tie joints will keep a piece from cracking or splitting. Um, ch changing subjects all of a sudden. <laughs> this is uh, one of our tools at our log yard, um, our smaller mill. And this shows some of the milling process. Um, our mill uh, can take up to eight foot diameter logs, which is quite substantial. One of the special things about the mill, I think, is that it runs um, throughout the year. So um, I'll visit our, our Sawyer at the mill during summertime right now, and it's, you know, 80 degrees out there, but he's also working out there when it's 27 degrees. <laughs> um, but he loves it. He loves the, the peace and quiet out there. Travis, where do you find your trees? Ah, good question. So, um, they're all found in the Seattle area. Um, and we've worked really hard over the past almost 20 years that we've been in business to network with a lot of arborists and tree cutting services so that when they have a customer that seems to have like a sizable tree that would be good for, and it's a hardwood, um, they oftentimes tell their, their customers to call us, see if we could um, utilize that tree in a better way. And a lot of times people jump at that chance. You know, it's, it's um, to a lot of folks, the trees are, um, I guess, more than a tree. 
um, sometimes they've, they've grown up with that tree or have memories around that tree or that home. And uh, the, it's hard for them to visualize making that tree become firewood or go to a dump or something like that. And so they're, they're very excited to find a, a resource that can put it to a better use. I think what you're seeing right now is uh, inside of our kiln oven, which um, again, it, it bakes it for about three weeks. I think it gets up to 160 degrees in there, kind of fluctuates in temperature. Um, yeah, so that was a little overview of our process. Um, and at this point, um, I was going to just kind of go around our workshop, uh, point out a few things, and eventually I'll find my way to show you some finished pieces that just got finished today. Travis, would you yes. be able to copy a head, a headboard and a king size bed for me? We um, copy, copy a photograph. I have a photograph and I can't find it. I can't find the place that sells it anymore. So yeah, okay. I'd be happy to try to help with that. Um, so some things that are unique about Urban Hardwoods is we we do use specialized wood. So depending on the style we may be the right resource or we might not be, but I'd, I'd be very happy to, to help you track down someone that could help if we can. not Great, thank you. You're welcome. So this was a table that was being worked on today. It looks like there is water on it perhaps, but that's not water. That is, marine grade epoxy fill um, that is clear. And uh, it's probably hard at this point, I I'm not gonna test it and, and touch it, but um, this is filling up all the cracks that are in the table. Basically this uh, marine grade epoxy, um, it expands and contracts along with the wood um, throughout the seasons. So it's a great material, I guess, to fill up those cracks without, um, while being structurally sound. Um, and while it's very noticeable now, once the rest of the finish is applied to this table, it's going to blend in beautifully. So a lot of these, these cracks here, they'll be visible and a beautiful feature of the wood, but you can run your hand over and it will be completely smooth there. And, um, and crumbs and juice and things like that that could spill on a table won't get stuck in those cracks. So again, this is a good example of, we kind of embrace the cracks in our wood and think of them as a feature. Uh, maybe a, a, a standard furniture manufacturer would probably disagree with that uh, in a different style of furniture, but we really love it. Um, moving over here, this table also, uh, it, it may not look like a table at this point. <laughs> maybe that's what I should note right away. So this, it's a little bit hard to visualize, and I can I think I think I can do it better using some pieces uh, in the back room. But this side should actually, once it's finished, will go on this side of the ta table, and there'll be a slight reveal in the center of the table. It's kind of disconfigured right now, but that's a popular design in which essentially the live edge right here is in the center of the table, and not on the outside, because some people really enjoy that live edge, as we call it, but um, it, it sometimes can create a functionality problem if there's too much of a live edge on the outside of the table. And so putting that live edge on the inside of the table kind of is the, the, both, the best of both worlds, if you will. I'm gonna take a quick uh, break from those just to show some of our flares here over on the wall. Um, it's probably hard to tell perspective, but these guys to me appear to be maybe between 40 and 50 inches in diameter. So those would make very sizable coffee tables. <laughs> we generally make our, our um, we call them flares. We generally do this style of cut when it is a softwood actually. Um, so versus our, our dining tables, which are almost all hardwoods, we get by with um, doing softwoods for our flare coffee tables because uh, cutting a wood that thick um, 
would take a long time to dry as a hardwood. The softwoods tend to dry faster. Also, the structure of that grain there, um, having it be a softwood makes it actually more structurally sound than maybe a hardwood that would cr crack and be a little bit more brittle. So that's why we oftentimes use softwoods for that. We do use hardwoods too, but that's one reason we get by with softwoods. Let's see here. I was going to show you a few other things. And do let me know if you have questions or I'm missing something along the way. So this, I'm going to skip this table because it's, it's really being worked on still. It looks like he's in the middle of applying some bow tie joints to it. And I think at this point, it's still two pieces of wood. And you can see this is a bow tie joint in process. That was probably just tapped in and glued today. And minor note, but we're probably looking at the underside of a table. On urban hardwoods tables, if a bow tie is round like this, it's usually um, going on the underside of a table. And if it's straight edges right here, like a crisp bow tie, that, those go on the top. So we're probably looking at the underside. This is a nice book match madrone table being worked on, also called madrona. Looks like it's uh, several pieces here. One, two, three, three different pieces of wood here. So you can kind of tell at this point how it starts blending in the seam. It's still visible at this point, and that's OK. But once finish is applied, um, it will be very hard to detect this seam, and even this seam here, unless, uh, unless you're told to look for it. Madrone's one of those really beautiful, uniquely Pacific Northwest woods that we have. Um, and it's probably one of the, the woods that are lesser used in furniture making because it does twist and turn in the drying process so much. And it's also very hard wood, so it eats up tools faster. It's a wood that probably other man manufacturers would not want to work with, but um, you get these beautiful grain tones, these really warm tones. It looks kind of blonde right now, um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to really warm up once the finish is applied. And I think I have some examples in our finishing booth of that. Um, I'm going to make my way to, well, I'll take a quick detour. <laughs> One Travis, side note. Yes. Travis, can I uh, interrupt? We had a question here. Um, we were wondering, where is your facility and um, are you taking internships right now? Oh, good question. So our um, facility is in Georgetown. That's where our main headquarters is. Um, and then in addition to that, this is a side note, our um, our mill is a little bit further south of here. We also have a drying facility. And then also we recently opened a showroom in Bellevue actually um, on the east side. Um, and, and about internships, um, I don't know if we're formally taking internship applications, but I will say through my six years of being here, we've had I think two or three interns. And so I would recommend anyone who might be interested in this to to reach out to me and I'll put you in touch. Um, I assume it's an internship for woodworking perhaps or design. And I would I would put that person in touch with our operations manager, Dave Hunsinger. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um I oh, hey. <laughs> I had a quick detour. I just wanted to note that we um and I'm sorry for the background noise. I'll talk a little louder. Um, we do our own metal work here. Um, and that is one benefit of, uh, of my job here. I don't, I, I can, I can uh, be very creative with the amount of uh, different base styles we have and then meeting uh, custom requirements and custom requests through our metal bases. So having a metal shop helps my job out a lot. <laughs> Sometimes people, um would request maybe uh their table be two inches above average height and i can 
I can fulfill that request. <laughs> um, I'll make our way to um, the finishing booth where we'll see some pieces that are about to have finish put on them and pieces that have put uh, finish on them. So uh, I'm gonna back out just a little bit here. We are looking at our finishing booth here. Um, basically, uh, this device here will suck up the fumes from the finish once it's applied. Um, there are spray guns over here and we, we wheel in tables right about here. And then our finisher um, applies our polyurethane finish. Um, ranging in the amount of coats, but oftentimes about two or three coats are put on the table. And the goal with that is to keep it looking pretty natural. We don't do um, staining generally. Um, and so it's just a clear finish. And as I say, we don't do staining. We're looking at a, a whitewash table here that hasn't had finish applied to it yet. Um, whitewashing and a little bit of darkening are, are two exceptions to maybe the staining that we do. But again, this hasn't had finish applied to it. Same with this too. Uh, finish has not been applied to this, and we're looking at right now one half and then the other half of a round table, a maple table that's going to be quite stunning. I'm going to come around here. This is, a, again, not finished, but it's going to be extremely figured maple once finish is applied to it. And we are looking at the bottom of the table. That's why there's grooves like that. But you can tell this uh, has a lot of figuring in it. But um, enough of unfinished products. <laughs> this is a finished oak table we're looking at. And uh, just a little bit ago, I was referencing the bow tie joints. Uh, this is how a top bow tie joint looks. See how it does have those nice crisp um, corners there. Um, different from the one we saw in the workshop. This is also one of those rare single slabs of wood. This was just a huge oak tree that grew. There's no seams in here. And you can see our team left this crack intentionally open. It's pretty functional in the sense that food and crumbs could fall through, fall through this crack, um, whereas they did put that clear fill on other smaller cracks that would present more problems perhaps um, when it's being used. Quite stunning grain on this. Travis, I have another question here if you'd like to take another one from Oh yeah, uh, yes please. Mr. Fairweather, if you would uh, care to unmute yourself, sir, I believe you had a question. Hey Charles, I, I just, uh, I'm a president of OpenSquare, so I've been through your facility before, but I, I know uh, one point, um, I think when I toured through a few years ago, they, you do have done projects where you've taken trees off of a construction site. Obviously you have to have a lot of time, but then reuse that tree for furniture within the new, usually commercial building. You're, you're exactly right. Yes. And, um, Probably one of our, our more exciting projects that we are, are working on right now, um, I believe I'm at liberty to say, <laughs> but the, we are involved in like uh, Microsoft's new campus, for example, um, just to name one. But, but yes, we have done what we call site salvages, where oftentimes it's a, a corporate customer um, looking at a new campus. They would like to do it as sustainably as possible and and also um, kind of uh, if, if they have to cut down trees, they'd like it to be part of their company story, I guess, going forward. And so they, they opt to perhaps make um, benches from the, the cedar trees that are on the new campus that they have to take down. Um, or, um, you know, they'll, they'll use the maple trees to make new conference tables. But as you noted, uh, in those situations, the, the customers do have to have quite a bit of a lead time um, to, to wait for those three years of drying. Um, but oftentimes, too, that's, that's not necessarily a problem with how long projects take and constructions take. Um, so, yeah, that's always exciting when we're able to do that and deliver kind of a, 
even more meaningful product to our uh, commercial customers. Thank you. Thank you. So we were looking at an unfinished Madrone earlier in the workshop, and this is how Madrone looks finished. Just beautiful tones, like it's, uh, it's soaking up the sun rays. That's how I kind of think of it. Um, I'm looking at my screen, and it's still coming out pretty light, but I, I should note that it's really rich in color in person. It's one of my favorite woods. And then right next to it is a walnut. This is one of those rare single slabs that we don't get all the time. Just really stunning grain on this one. So the reason you are seeing this, I just like pointing it out. You are looking at the underside of the table on this. But it should be as equally beautiful on the top. <laughs> Um, and then here's one of our flares. This is a English walnut flare. Oops, sorry about that. So um, I think this table looks like a heart. <laughs> so I'm calling it the heart table. <laughs> but you can tell it's it's one of those trees where, frankly, it probably um, had some rot from the inside, and over the years it probably grew around that soft part. Um, that was inside the tree. And see, that's the that's a perfect example of where um, you know uh, this probably wouldn't be used for for any other purpose other than this beautiful piece of art. Um, and one thing I'll note about these two, the kids love counting the rings on these trees and finding out how old they are, um, which are usually under a hundred years old. Most of this this wood you see in here. Um, probably between, I would estimate, 50 and 100 years old. It's rare that we get something older than 100. Um, it just grows so fast here in Seattle. Um, thank you for the compliments. I'm going to go into our administrative office here, and I'm getting to the part in our tour where um, we could probably get close to answering questions, but I just wanted to um, point out a couple more pieces. This is, a, it might be hard to see what we're looking at exactly, but this is a very long bar top that we just completed. Um, I'll kind of walk all the way to the end here. It's, a, it's quite a feat. Um, to accomplish such a long bar top, we have to um, kind of discreetly put um, metal supports underneath the table. It's not installed at this moment, but um, I guess all that is to say is that uh, a lot of engineering is gonna go into this table to make it structurally sound um, at the end of the day. And in addition to that, um, these are for surface mount power and HDMI connections. Um, this is something we do oftentimes with our commercial clients as they would like power routed into their conference tables and team tables, and so um, we do that. One other thing I should note with this table is you notice it's kind of a dark gray color. Um, this is a process we call ebonizing. It's not technically a staining process, meaning uh, nothing's being painted onto the wood. It's actually a vinegar solution, vinegar that's been reacted with steel wool. We put it on the table and it reacts naturally with the tannins in the wood. So places in the wood that is rich of tannins um, will get more dark. Places that aren't will get less dark. But it's our way of kind of staying true to the natural colors and grain and not painting over something that's naturally beautiful, I guess. Um, really beautiful features. And lastly, uh, a walnut table that was just completed. The customer just saw this table right before this meeting tonight, and she was very happy about her table. I think it turned out beautifully. And with that, um, I would open it up to, 
to any questions anyone has or anything that I might have forgotten to talk about that um, someone can point out. <laughs> anyone have any questions for Travis? I'd be curious, Travis, what's your favorite slab of wood? Oh, that is a good question. I, um, ooh, a favorite slab. I really like, well, species-wise, I like walnut, ebonized maple, and madrone. Um, it's really a three-way tie for me. Favorite slab of wood. You know, oftentimes, because I've seen so many woods and they're all, uh, so many slabs and they're all beautiful, I will say my customers probably stand out to me more than maybe, or just as much the tabletops I sell them. Um, the experiences I have with them and like the, the stories we share and sometimes the meaning behind why they're buying a table or they're, they're even just meeting their family. That's what stands out to me oftentimes in the, in the buying process, if you will. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what kind of wood that magnificent long bar table is? The one that, um, sorry for the quick spin. I'll go slow. <laughs> this one here? Uh -huh. This is ebonized oak here. Oh, oak. And oak. All, yeah, and also I, you, you show us that just a finished uh, walnut wood table over there. But there is a piece of dark, dark walnut wood against a wall. How come the color wise is, is such a difference? Oh, um, I like well, the one that against the wall that unfinished that kind of dark walnut wood. Are they all walnut? Ah, uh, good. So they're not all walnut. Um, and that might be some of the color differences between different woods. But you touched on a really important point. Even if um, we're looking at the same wood, like um, if we were looking at two walnut tables, but they were made from different trees. Um, they can vary in tone um, sometimes a lot, actually. Um, and that's one thing that, that, that makes my job really important, educating our customers about what to expect. You know, we, we do have wood samples, but they're really um, an example of, of roughly what your table's surface will look like. But the, the fun part of someone who's buying an urban hardwoods table is that no urban hardwoods table is the same. So yours is going to be unique. There might be color variations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we, we have different ways of letting people know what to expect. But it's definitely one of the, the fun parts of my job that I have to consider and make sure I educate people about. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Do you ever work with birch? We do. Yeah. Um, let's see. I might have... I don't think we have any birch in the finishing room right now, but yes, every once in a while we do. It's probably probably less than 10% of our tables are made from birch. Um, and sometimes that the reason that a low portion is made from a certain wood is could be different reasons. Um, I'm not sure in this case, but sometimes it has to do with um, certain trees don't grow maybe as large as other trees, so we're salvaging them less. Um, sometimes, uh, like a popular question we have is if we have cherry wood. We do have some cherry wood, but oftentimes my production team has told me the, the reason we don't have a lot of it is because it's um, cherry wood in the Seattle area sometimes has a lot of wind blowing on it, has micro fractures in the, in the grain, in the wood fibers. Um, so just different reasons why we might have more of one type of wood and less of another type of wood. Travis, when you had that uh, one slab table that you showed, how many of those slabs can you get off of a tree that big? Ah, um, so that one, I think you're talking about the walnut one that yeah. was in there. So I think we have at least five slabs that are very similarly shaped from that log. So I call them sister slabs. That's not all the slabs we got from that log, but, but it gives you a sense of, I guess, from that portion of the log, we could get five dining table sized single slabs and the rest of the material made up what we call multi-piece tables, like, like this one here, that's four different pieces of wood. Right. Um, 
So I, I don't know exactly how many tables come from the log and I need to, to ask about that, but it's also probably gonna vary from log to log as well. So that's a great question. Our operations manager would be able to answer that a lot better than me. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I have one quickly, Greg. What is the smallest tree that you would consider? Good question. So I think our minimum diameter requirements, and it would vary, but I think we're probably wanting at least 30 inches in diameter. I think technically 20, anything below 26 is just, we just, um, we don't consider it at all because um, we just can't use it. Thank you. You're welcome. Travis, if I wanted to buy one of these tables, how would I do that? Ah, um, so I would recommend visiting our Bellevue showroom um, that we just opened up. Um, it's open uh, Monday through Saturday and, or excuse me, Tuesday through Saturday. Um, and we'd be happy to give you a tour there, whether you're interested in buying or just interested in learning more. I'd be happy to show you around and talk about all the different types of wood. All right. Well, thanks, Travis. Do you have uh, any closing remarks that you'd like to? Like, Th should, thank I, you all. Should, should I share the, uh, your email with the people? <laughs> oh, yes, please. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me um, uh, with any questions you have. Um, I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're in the area, let me know and I'd be happy to give you a tour in person, maybe after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Travis. What, what's, what's the name of your company? Oh, Urban Hardwoods. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Urban Hardwoods. Now, the great, great presentation, Travis, and uh, beautiful woods. And uh, great to have you show us what, you, what you're doing. I've walked past the uh, old showroom down on First Avenue a few times, and they're just beautiful. That's closed now, I guess. That's true. Um, our, so uh, our, our showroom on First Ave did close down. Um, just to real briefly explain some of the reasoning, it's because so many customers skipped that showroom and just wanted to come to the workshop. <laughs> so actually the room you're looking at in back of me, the reason it is a little cluttered admittedly is because it's gonna become our Seattle showroom. We're going to have, by hopefully the time that you can visit us in person, um, when COVID is out of our lives, uh, this will be filled with all a bunch of finished pieces for you to look at and you can visit us here in Seattle or in Bellevue, whichever is most convenient. Great. Whoop, I've got a couple of more chats up. Oh, people are thanking you, commenting Thank you. how gorgeous and informative, gorgeous the furniture is and informative you are. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Um, and Thank so you, everyone. I guess this comes to the conclusion of the event. Um, this was a first foray into decorative arts for the Arts Committee. And if the members of the Rainier Club want to let me know how or what you thought of this and whether you'd like to see more decorative arts things, send me an email, let me know. So thanks, Travis. Thanks everyone for coming. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.